particularly, a, or I wasn't a water person, and until fourth year medical school, didn't really have any knowledge or interest or any particular inclination to do anything water related. And then suddenly the bug bit. And from fourth year medical school, things changed. And, um, and then suddenly the whole trajectory of my medical interest, if you like, moved me in a direction where uh, in my uh, final year, I actually had the, op uh, the opportunity to work at Sudwana Bay as a paramedic at that stage, because I wasn't a qualified okay. doctor yet. And at that uh, time, it was still under the auspices of uh, Medical Rescue International. And the, the challenge that has always been there um, is wanting to be a hotline. In other words, someone that people can talk to, that share their view, their passion, their understanding. If, if they refer to viz or the, they refer to uh, jargon that is just diving jargon, that there is uh, an understanding that you are talking to a health professional that is able to speak your language. And that's where it started. And uh, we were privileged to evolve that into Divers Alert Network. Uh, and we realized very quickly that uh, there's only so much you can do over the phone. So the idea of Dan was primarily a hotline. And from that, inevitably there came the need to to find ways to better help divers that call and that involved providing the means for them to get third party individuals uh, to assist them and the only way to do that uh, and uh, to do that as an organization was to have what uh, we call a group um, insurance policy so Dan itself is insured, and we extend that benefit to our members. Mm. So essentially, uh, if you think of Dan as, as a, a single body, you know, each bit of us is like a member. And whether you're stubbing your toe or, or uh, got a hangnail, if you like, the, mm. the, uh, the, <laughs> the medical uh, or the cover really extends to that particular limb of Dan as an organization as a whole. Mm. So that was the one piece. And then it became very obvious that we wanted to improve the care the divers got where the injuries and things were happening. So that started the training and the promotion of diving safety initiatives, uh, oxygen on, on boats, uh, collaborating with dive resorts, and, uh, and various ways of just making it wherever we found the need was there. People couldn't get oxygen, we find a way for them to get oxygen. People can't get oxygen units, we find oxygen units. People can't get, can't get training in oxygen, uh, oxygen providing, we find a way to do that. So it's, yeah. it's always yeah. been about divers helping divers, Mona, and, and that's really yeah. been my passion yeah. And uh, I must say, just, you know, while, while we have this time, I want to thank you for, for really steering the ship. And, um, and uh, you've been such, such an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, extension of, of uh, Dan's character, because uh, we are a family. We, we think of ourselves as a family, as an organism more than an organization. And uh, these webinars are just a way to talk to the family. And uh, that's how I see it. And um, thanks for including me and uh, allowing me to continue contributing in these ways. Well, it's only a pleasure. And if I have to take something that uh, you mentioned about halfway through what you were uh, um, uh, talking about was the one part that when you find the Dan hotline, you actually have people that understand dive lingo. A BCD, I'm at Bass Lake, I'm at this destination, wherever I might be in the world, um, you have the medics and the, and the doctors understand uh, what diving is about because they divers themselves. So, so that's a big plus, you know, and then all the other stuff obviously is great, the research, training, all that kind of programs. Anyways, um, let's see, we, we, we're about two minutes short from 10 past uh, uh, six. So how about I do a couple of quick introductions? We still got a, uh, some folks joining. 
But by the time I'm done with the introductions and a couple of notes that I'd just like to share with everybody, um, then we can kickstart the meeting. So um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody, those folks that joined a little bit uh, uh, later. My name is Mornay Christo. I'm the CEO of Dan Southern Africa. And uh, my guest this evening is Dr. Franz Cronier. Uh, he's the founder of Dan Southern Africa. So that's uh, really a privilege to have him on board this evening. Um, so for the folks that joined a little bit later, I can see, wow, man, we've got people from all around the world. We've got Bloemfontein yeah. there, Centurion, South Africa, Cape Town, Canada, Liverpool. Uh, I've got some folks on Facebook from uh, Washington, Seattle, or Seattle, Washington, uh, Egypt. Um, so, wow, that's pretty cool to have the folks. It looks like I've got real down Nisner side. So, wow, you know, people from all over the world. That's fantastic to have you guys here. Please keep introducing yourself. Tell us where you're from uh, while we wait uh, and get the things uh, up and running. Uh, let's have a look. I've got a couple of notes here just to take note. First of all, for everybody that's joined and made the time uh, to attend this webinar, thank you very much. Uh, I know all our time is valuable, so we want to give you the best we can this evening. You know, hopefully it'll be entertaining but informative at the same time. So um, please let us know afterwards uh, what your thoughts are, or even during the uh, um, the webinar. Just staying tight. Okay, what else have I got? Um, uh, just want to see here. Hang tight. We've got too many people happening, uh, trying to get in at the same time. <laughs> all right. So the other part, obviously, is that I hope that all the folks joining are, you know, in good spirit, healthy and safety during this uh, very difficult time. And especially for divers, you know, we'd like to travel, get around. Uh, the folks in Southern Africa are really having a tough time getting to all their favorite dive spots and, and visiting the family and, and friends that they know. Um, so that, that's a bit of a bugger. I know some of the folks in, in Europe and in the States, uh, they managed to, to get around and do some diving. So hopefully um, in Southern Africa, we'll also have time to do that. Uh, during the webinar, if I can just ask all the attendees uh, to please stay muted. If you somehow manage to unmute yourself, uh, just you know hit the mute button again so we can avoid any uh, noise interference during the webinar and the lecture and so forth. Um, continue to introduce yourself via the Zoom chat box and the Facebook uh, comment box for those that are, are um, uh, you know, joining via Facebook. And if you have any questions, obviously those are the channels you can use to post them in there. And I'll do my best to keep an eye on those and pass them on to Dr. Franz Cronier. Uh, one thing I would encourage you is not to just quickly start asking questions as the uh, lecture starts. Maybe just give it a, you know, a bit of time. As the, the lecture continues, you'll most probably find that most of your questions will be answered. But if not, you know, the facility is there. Please make sure to use that. Um, <clears throat> then uh, the replay of the webinar will be available via Facebook pretty much immediately after the webinar. And um, I will also make it available tomorrow via the Dan Southern Africa YouTube channel. And um, for the folks that registered via uh, Zoom, I will then obviously send you a follow-up email with uh, the replay link along with all the resources that Dr. Cronier will share with you this evening. Now, for the folks that um, have joined via Facebook, um, if uh, you'd like to receive that follow-up email, <clears throat> you can you know, it's up to you. Leave uh, your email address in the comments box. But if that's not great, I'm going to leave an email address uh, for you and I'll say it out loud now. It's dansa at dansa.org. You're welcome to mail me and I'll then just include you in the mailing list and uh, make sure that you get that follow up email. So let me just quickly do that. All right. Okay. And uh, I'll do the same for the Zoom folks, although you should be on the mailing list, but you might want to share it with some people that you know. So there we go. All right. Um, then for the folks that registered by uh, uh, Zoom, uh, we've got a lucky draw. So please stick around until the end of the webinar when I'll be entering uh, the names of the people that participated into some random picking software that I have. And the prizes that are up for grab is one, uh, a hoodie like I'm wearing, and then also one of the Dan jackets. Uh, Dr. Cronier will share the, some images with you sort of halfway through uh, the webinar. 
So uh, before we get started, I've got a pop quiz uh, that I'd like to launch and just to get a feel for whether the folks that are attending the webinar actually struggle with their ears while they're diving or possibly you know of people that struggle with uh, their ears while they're diving. So I'm going to launch this now via uh, what you call it, Zoom. And for the folks on uh, Facebook, just bear with me. I'm going to try and launch it to uh, Facebook as well. Uh, you guys are welcome to, to get on with it, the folks via Zoom. And let me see if I can get this here. All right. I love it. I mean, I can see the numbers just clicking on 10, 42, 12, 15, 16, 17. That's, that's really, really excellent. And, and what I can see clearly is that ears are a major issue in diving. And uh, it's very obvious from our hotline statistics. It's very obvious from the statistics that you yourselves can see uh, in front of you as we just see that people are taking decongestants to dive. Uh, they're struggling sometimes to equalize with, and uh, uh, when diving. And uh, one of the statistics we have is that about 60% of divers at some stage have a problem with their ears. And that is mm. pretty much exactly what we see here on the screen. So yeah. the relevance of this topic is undeniable. And we've got 80% of the people already uh, polling. And uh, that's, that's very, very useful to me. And, and I hope right. uh, this evening that uh, there'll be encouragement um, for the folks to, uh, to find ways uh, to, to solve uh, the equalizing problems. And we'll discuss it as we go along. All right. So um, we still got the folks from, you know, by Facebook doing uh, their bit, but it's uh, very similar to the, um, the Zoom uh, poll that we, or quiz that we've just launched. So I'll just close that up for the moment. And um, we can get on while I just sort out those things there. All right. Got another person admitting. Okay, well, for the folks that have participated by the Zoom pop quiz, uh, thank you very much. Um, the folks via Facebook, they're still getting on with it, so that's fine. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Franz Cronier uh, in a moment, uh, but just again to introduce you uh, to everybody that's uh, recently joined. My name is Mornay Christo, CEO of Dan Southern Africa, and then I have uh, the guest speaker this evening is Dr. Franz Cronier, the founder, uh, former CEO and president uh, a medic of Dan Southern Africa. He's a medical doctor uh, with a keen or a passion for dive medicine and a keen interest in ears. And with that brief introduction, I'm going to hand over to, to you, Dr. Franz. Thank you very much for that, Mornay. Yes, and I'm just, I'm thrilled. Uh, you have no idea how satisfying it is uh, for me to see that we've uh, reached a stage where we can do these webinars. And we really hope that we'll be able to extend uh, the services and, and uh, respond to, to the needs that divers have and questions they have uh, more and more real time using various platforms. Uh, Mornay, um, I must uh, tip my hat to you, uh, the way in which you've been able to master all the social media. You know, I wouldn't even be able to manage all, all the, the buttons and clicks and things that you are able to do. Uh, you told me earlier that you've got five screen going, uh, screens going <laughs> simultaneously. So I, I think, you know, round of applause to you. Well, well done. So uh, good for you. I've got two. And um, let's see how, how, how I do in sharing that with you. So at the moment, uh, Mona, if you could just confirm, can you see uh, the ear sinuses and diving uh, in front of you with the video clip, which will be shortly be animated there you go are yeah, you seeing it in front of you okay all right so we're there so yes as we saw in the the poll that Mornay actually put forward so many people struggle with their ears and that comes as no surprise because uh ears are uh, one of the primary if not the primary organ that is assaulted by the change in pressure when we dive. I work in aerospace medicine as well, 
And just to give you a, a, a bit of a perspective here, uh, when you descend from a typical cabin altitude, you're flying at 40,000 feet. Uh, funnily enough, we f fly in feet and dive in meters, thanks to the French. Uh, but if you're flying physically at uh, 44,000 feet, cabin altitude is 8,000. And from that down to sea level, where they open the door, you basically had a pressurization, which is the equivalent of 2.3 meters. So the entire, you, you know, if you think about the atmospheric column and the, uh, the amount uh, of distance that you covered in atmospheres, you know, 8,000 feet is two meters. So we really need to, uh, under, well, we need to comprehend and understand that ear problems are far more likely to uh, be a uh, concern to divers than they would be to aviators, for instance. Now, we've got various resources, and you can see here our Dan uh, webpage where we've got um, uh, the uh, various playlists and the uh, various uh, resources, uh, chats, channels, um, all kinds of fora and, um, and different themes, safety themes that you may have an interest in and uh, would be meaningful for you to um, have a look at. And please don't be shy. If you uh, have a question, I'm sure that there will be people watching this video that probably have very specific questions. It might involve detailed information that we won't be able to cover in the time we have here, but that doesn't mean we don't want to pay attention to it. So I want to invite you now um, to make sure that by chat, by email, or by some means, uh, you get your questions across to us because we want to really be able to uh, answer and address that. And if we don't know the answer, it means that both of us are learning something. And that's what we'd like to do. Continue learning together and helping one another. This is a short video. You can look it up on YouTube. On, it's on the Dan YouTube channel. It's a very brief uh, introduction on ear equalization and gives divers an opportunity to just hear about some of the techniques that we'll be talking about tonight. So this is something that instructors might find useful to use. And I invite you to um, actually revisit that if you like or seek it or find it. And um, if you've got a friend or somebody that struggles to equalize, that's one of the things you can do. And there are various ways in which you can connect to us. You know, if, if, there's, if there's something or there's some way to connect, Mornay somehow has the wizardry of finding a way to get Dan connected to it. So uh, we, we will find you somehow, or you'll find us. Uh, and uh, that's what we want to do. Now, many people will ask, why is it that we have the problems with ears uh, to the extent that we do? Well, I covered the aerospace aspect side, but the other aspect side is because ear or ear, nose and throat problems are so common. I mean, even COVID-19 is family of the common cold virus and the symptoms are related to the respiratory, and that includes upper respiratory symptoms. So all of this has to do with ears and equalizing. And because these are airfield spaces, uh, uh, by and large, we will have the combination of Boyle's law affecting these areas as pressure and volume changes. And for that reason, we need to find ways to actively equalize because in our usual day-to-day -day going around, we're not even aware that we're continuously having our middle ears sucked into a partial vacuum. And usually, and we'll give you a chance just now to test that, uh, we just swallow, yawn, chew, or do something very simple, and that equalizes the pressure. Not so when we dive. If that happens, we need to have more active uh, methods in which to equalize. Now, what makes diving unique is that we have water and we have pressure. So there's some issues that happen. In fact, all of our senses, every single one of the five senses we have, vision, hearing, taste, smell, and touch 
are all deranged when we dive. It is a completely foreign experience to the entire body because our hearing no longer is directional. Our vision is magnified. Uh, touch changes because we're now weightless. Um, taste is largely irrelevant unless you, you can taste the air in your regulator or you know something like that is possible. Um, and, uh, and smell, of course, is irrelevant because your nose isn't a mask. So we literally have, have a complete reset. On top of that, we have the pressure changes. And what we're interested in primarily tonight is going to be the trauma aspect, which is what we want to avoid. And um, just, uh, just looking at this, the assault that we have on our ears, and I'm going to walk you through it. Water itself has its effects, as I mentioned. Temperature can cause vertigo. External ear barotrauma, and we'll talk about that if you've got earplugs. Changes in sound perception. Risk of infection, middle ear barotrauma, decompression sickness, gas embolism, noise-induced hearing loss if you work with compressors or have a lot of noise uh, in the environment that you work, especially commercial divers struggle with this to a great extent. High pressure nervous syndrome, which is when we have rapid deep dives involving helium, uh, we can have deranged, uh, deranged functions of our ears, in the ear barotrauma. So you can see there's a lot going on. And if we look at this from a physical and a functional point of view, uh, the physical things are fairly simple uh, because they're painful. <laughs> and that's why we pay attention to them. Uh, and it's very rare for someone that has a painful ear condition that won't at some stage seek advice. What troubles me as a diving doctor and as a diver is that the functional side, which is the hearing and balance side, does not necessarily get the same attention. And it's amazing how people will sometimes go around with deafness or ringing in their ears or a slight amount of vertigo or loss of uh, balance for a couple of days before they seek advice. So one of the things I'd really like to plant as a seed is please have the uh, freedom uh, to seek advice uh, and medical attention if there is an impairment of hearing or balance. And balance is not only about staying on your two feet, it's also what allows you to read. If you bob your head, you're still able to read. It's one of the fastest reflexes in the body, our visual ocular reflex, that allows us to uh, keep our eyes synchronized as we change position. So these are functions that can be enormously disruptive if they uh, are injured. So these are all things that people need to know about. Okay, so with that uh, little soapbox introduction, I'm going to walk us through the ear, and some of the things are gonna be familiar to you, and I make no apology because I think it's necessary to just once again focus on some of the things that are simple, but we forget. One of the things, and we're starting here with the external ear, is that we have the pinna, which is the visible protrusion. And you can probably guess why I really have an interest in ears, because, you know, they're highly visible. But uh, believe it or not, our middle ear or the eardrum is not necessarily as symmetrical as the external ears usually are, unless you have them injured during, uh, with contact sports and so on. And then we have this little fleshy mound in front of the ear, which is called the trachus. And that's important because if it's painful when you press on it, you've got swimmer's ear infection until proven otherwise. And of course, there's the hole, which allows the sound and water to enter our ears when we dive. Now I'm taking you on a little video tour. And the important thing here is the first part you see hairs. And you see these little spots, and those are actually glands that produce this yellow stuff, which is wax or cerumen, which is modified. But the important thing, and this is a misnomer that many instructors sometimes uh, teach their students, is that wax protects our ears. It does to some extent, but it does not do that completely. In fact, it's only the outer third of our ears that has the ability to produce that wax. And so if the 
Uh, wax is on the inside of the outer third, something or someone put it there. It's not natural to be there. And so our ears are vulnerable to water. And one of the problems that we have as a result of that is not only the pressure effect, but also the prevalence of um, uh, infections, which we'll address. So we're going to talk about the common problems, uh, swimmer's ear, barotitis externa, and exostoses as well, because those may not necessarily be covered typically. Now, otitis externa happens as a result of exposure to water, and especially because what happens when we dive is our ears get wet and dry and wet and dry. And, well, if you'll permit the South African humor, somehow our posterior, and you'll know what I'm talking about, and our ears have been endowed with a maximum propensity to itch. Now, the one you usually can't reach for various reasons, mostly because you've got clothes on or a wetsuit, but the ears... You know, people tend to fiddle with their ears. If it's earbuds or towels or various things they put in their ear. And the one big lesson is you don't want to do that because that's one of the ways in which infection can really set in and uh, ultimately cause uh, uh, problems uh, with different organisms. And we'll talk about how we deal with that. And the classic signs, which you won't always see with divers, um, is that the canal narrows, there's a discharge, and if you touch the person's ears, they're going to want to slap you because it is really, really painful, and uh, that's one of the telltale signs. Now, I mentioned already, wax doesn't do everything we need. Our skin in our ears gets waterlogged. There is the nature of itching that sometimes gets us to scratch it. And then these organisms like Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, E. coli, and Candida can all really set up an infection that can be particularly painful. So please, one take-home message is never put anything in your ear sharper than your elbow. And I think you get the take-home message, nothing goes in your ear. <laughs> Secondly, Mostly, when we treat infections of the external ear in a non-diving setting, there is a more conservative approach, and we usually just use topical drops. But in diving, we are far more aggressive. And the reason is that people continue diving, and the exposure they get is typically far more than they would get otherwise. And for that reason, we are far more readily um, willing to prescribe antibiotics and cortisone. And I know people don't like cortisone, people don't like antibiotics, and there are a lot of reasons why they may not necessarily want that. But when it comes to infections in the ear, it's really important to keep the swelling down because once that canal is swollen shut, it's very, very difficult to get all the debris out that keep the infection going. So cortisone is necessary in many cases, as of course um, would be the antibiotics. Now there are some ways that you can protect your ears. And one of the ways, a very interesting one, was actually developed by an ENT surgeon in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. And it's available in most pharmacies, clicks, that sort of thing. It's called Swim Seal. And what it does is it actually provides a thin coat over the ear and it does, to some extent, protect ears against infection. It's, it won't help everybody, but it is something that is, I would say, from experience, slightly superior to the uh, diluted vinegar that uh, people would typically use. And the... Um, uh, Aluminium or aluminum for our American viewers, acetate that uh, is called a domiboro, which is an astringent. In other words, it dries the ears. Really, unfortunately, isn't available uh, typically and often isn't enough uh, at the stage when the infection is set in. Now, when it comes to treatment, I'm not expecting most of the viewers that aren't medically trained to diagnose 
um, or certainly treat an external infection. But what I would want to point out is that quadriderm, which is something that you can mostly get in Europe, uh, in Africa, and in the Orient, but not necessarily in America, you can in Canada, is really one of the best treatments for external in ear infections. And what you're looking at over here is a wick. It's, a, it's just a little uh, a rolled up gauze, which has been wetted with the quadriderm um, uh, a cream. It's a cream, it's not an ointment. Now, uh, the uh, quadriderm contains gentamicin, and why I want to mention that is gentamicin, if it comes in contact with the inner ear, not the middle ear of the eardrum, but the inner ear is potentially toxic. So we don't want to be putting quadriderm into ears if people, you know, when they equalize, hear wind whistling out of their ears, okay? Because that means they've got a hole in the eardrum. But if it really is swimmer's ear, then putting that impregnated uh, um, uh, swab in the ear as far as you could get it, uh, as soon as you can start, is really a very, very good way to just win literally two, three, four days, uh, which otherwise could ruin an entire diving holiday. So it's something we'd like uh, people to, to, to be aware of. And at this point, we're actually going to uh, give you a pop quiz. We've got uh, pop quizzes throughout um, uh, the, uh, the presentation. And I'd just like to know if you'd uh, like to poll, just read through those uh, because I'd like to just uh, find out what you know about middle ear barotrauma versus swimmer's ear. We're going to talk about equalizing techniques and how to avoid the middle ear barotrauma, but I'd just like to see. Uh, and don't be afraid. We won't. We don't know who, who you are. So, so uh, don't be shy. Uh, just get on board. Just click as you think. Um, uh, if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. It gives us an opportunity to set things straight. Um, those are opportunities for us to to really uh, get a sense of of what you, most of you are thinking. So okay, this is really, just, really really really. Yeah. Well. Just while we wait for the folks on Zoom, I've also got the folks from Facebook uh, participating. Yeah. So um, there is a bit of a delay, I think roughly about 20 seconds. But, um, yeah. uh, you know, if there's anything that stands out, I'll let you know. But uh, okay. for the most part, um, yeah, it seems like uh, everything's working well so far. Okay. So let's visit that first question. The first question was a middle ear barotrauma. Now, 37 or 38, it varies a bit, you know, as people are filling it in, said that middle ear barotrauma would be painful if you tug on the ear. Now, that is actually not the, ca uh, not the case because with middle ear barotrauma, your external ear is not affected. It's the eardrum that's painful. So typically, one of the ways that we can distinguish a squeeze from a swimmer's ear is by you know just determining is it painful in and around the ear that's one of the telltale signs yep 50 percent said that it's difficult to equalize obviously if you couldn't equalize you develop middle ear barotrauma so that would all invariably be one of the signs deafness you can have deafness in both conditions if the canal has closed so much with an infection that uh, you know your your uh, ability to get sound to pass through is impaired. You can in fact develop deafness, but uh, the intention here was mostly to so, uh, to to show you that middle ear barotrauma has uh, the greatest effect, and narrowing of the external ear canal is is irrelevant with middle ear barotrauma. So that we would almost never see. On the other hand, if we look at swimmer's ear. Uh, equalizing is a non-issue, as most of the people said. Um, deafness is usually not an issue unless the ear canal is closed. 64% rightly said that pain in tugging the ear would be a telltale sign, uh, whereas difficulty clearing the ears on descent should not be a problem with swimmer's ear. 
unless the swimmer's ear infection has also caused inflammation in the middle ear, which it sometimes can. And in those cases, you can actually get problems. It's rare, but there are situations in which um, you can have difficulty equalizing because of uh, a swimmer's ear condition. But the bottom line that I'd like to leave with you is, if it's painful when you pull on the ear, it's an external ear infection or swimmer's ear. And if, it's a, if you have problems equalizing or it's painful when you equalize or you have bubbles when you equalize, it's a middle ear problem. Either way, uh, it needs to be taken care of. Okay, good show. All right, so what about the next problem? Is it possible to have barotrauma or pressure damage of the external ear? Well, believe it or not, yes, it is. You can put, you can, or you can create an airspace in the external ear canal by putting an earplug or having a tight fitting hoodie or really impacted wax. Now, I have to say to my, uh, you know, as a, as a novice diving physician, I was scrupulous in removing every bit of wax that I could see in someone's ear. And you know what? The, the incidence of external ear infections was about 100%. In other words, I caused people to be vulnerable to external ear infections. Mm -hmm. So what I've learned is what you don't want to do is to remove wax unnecessarily. If the wax causes problems with hearing or with uh, uh, equalization of the external ear, then sure, it needs to be removed, but don't do it unnecessarily. That's a very, very important thing uh, to be aware of. You shouldn't wear earplugs, but you know what? Uh, there are exceptions, and I'm going to show those to you in a moment. A tight-fitting hoodie can cause barotrauma of the external ear, and uh, fortunately, it's not a major, major issue. And uh, this uh, sort of nasty looking thing over here, what you're looking at here is an eardrum and uh, the red part. And I have to say, this is my wife's ear. She volunteered and, and I photoshopped it, but it's actually a pretty good representation after looking in a lot of ears over 25 years you have these small little bleeds on the outside of the rim of where the eardrum attaches to the external ear canal. And that's one of the telltale signs of a reverse block or barotrauma of the external ear. You may also have signs of middle ear barotrauma, but the classic signs are the, are the rim on the outside. So that's just a, a, a tip but for those of you that didn't know about it. Now, on the topic of earplugs, I want to just clarify a couple of things. Firstly, for flying, there are plugs that are available. they are various brands. I'm just mentioning one of them here, earplanes. And these little devices are typically uh, either complete occluders or they have a little ceramic filter. And what they do is they slow down the effect that pressure has on the eardrum as you um, are, have an increase in cabin pressure. Now, the descent from 8,000 feet in the cabin, which is typical of a, a commercial airliner to sea level, happens over about 30 minutes. So it's a very, very slow process. Whereas when you dive, the first two meters, I mean, it, it's a second or two and you're there. So these plugs don't work in water, uh, both because the pressure is too great, and secondly, because that little filter that they have uh, actually becomes completely blocked with water. So, uh-uh, you can't use ear plugs when diving. If you do, for various reasons or in various ways, you can actually get bleeding. And uh, I showed you that earlier on. Funnily enough, people sometimes say, well, it's less painful on the eardrum, particularly those who fly. And the reason why that happens is because with the modest pressure changes in flying, the eardrum essentially stands in the neutral position. 
you basically have a bit of a vacuum on the on the middle ear side, bit of a vacuum now on the external ear side. So the painful part of the ear, which is the eardrum, doesn't really move, which is why it seems and in aviation actually does work. But that is not the case with diving. So no earplugs with diving. Having said that, I want to make the exception of the so-called docs, uh, docs Pro Plugs. Now, I had the privilege of meeting Doc Scott. Uh, I hope he's still alive. I haven't heard from him in a while. But uh, he was a surfer and an ENT surgeon. And his interest really was protecting surfers from developing the bony outgrowths that I'll show you in a moment. But he then got the idea of making these fenestrated or little holes in these partial or, or, or the, the ear occluders, if you like, and making them partially um, uh, um, able to, to allow pressure through. So believe it or not, these can actually be used with diving, the docks Pro Plugs. And I'll mention now, and I might uh, do it again. And Mornay, you just stick up your hand if there's something that I need to, to pay attention to as we go along. Um, the Docs Pro plugs, you must look for the ones that are transparent and um, not the pink ones. The pink ones are complete occluding earplugs. The transparent ones have this little valve called a Scott valve, which you can see over there, and you can see it more clearly here uh, uh, on, the, on the slide over here. So what that valve does is it actually allows the pressure to be transmitted. And I have to admit, personally, years ago, I thought this was nonsense. And I was working with the police task force at that stage, and they were my guinea pigs. And I gave them a bunch of these, and I said, do you want to give it a try? I don't want to give you a, uh, an imitation of the facial expression of the leader of the task force team, but he was willing to humor me and he decided he'd give it a go. And you know what? Two weeks later, they said, Doc, those funny things that you gave us, they work like a charm. We haven't had ear infections. And it's really, really made it easier to dive. And I stood humbled because before then, I was preaching that earplugs were a pariah, something you couldn't use. And that's still true because these aren't actually plugs. They partial ear occluders. And what you'll see here is, uh, and I don't recommend you do this, but just to show you how this works, uh, the individual on the video clip here is actually equalizing and they've got a Docs Pro plug in their ear and they're actually diving with um, tympanic membrane perforation. So they've actually got a hole in their eardrum. They were equalizing and they were getting bubbles coming through the Scott valve. Now, by no means do I recommend you should do this. But what I am telling you is that at least 55,000 divers that I'm aware of are diving with these Docs Pro plug earplugs and uh, find them beneficial. And uh, some of you may know Tanya Strita who's uh, one of the uh, world champion free divers. She dives with Doc Pro Plugs. And if you could go down to 160 meters with ease and you don't get ear barrow trauma, that's a pretty good statement that they shouldn't give you problems. So uh, we don't want to endorse products um, as Divers Alert Network, but from experience, I would say that we found that it helps a number of people. There's a convenient uh, scaling uh, uh, a template that allows you to select the right size. Remember, go for the transparent ones. And the people that I found do the best with these or really benefit from them are those that have very sensitive ears, you know, that really uh, notice uh, even slight pressure changes on their ears. They find these very useful. Uh, those that just want a bit more quiet when they dive, less bubble noise, found them useful. 
And then those people who find that the one ear equalizes a little bit more easier than the other, they tend to benefit from them as well. Okay, so they, uh, those would be the people I'd consider. Then they're the people that find that the first dive, they're doing great. And then the second and third dive, it's getting harder and harder to equalize. Those individuals tend to get benefit by wearing these Doc Pro plugs because they do dampen the pressure on the eardrum and uh, the consequent mild forms of barotrauma that then cause problems on the second or the third dive. I would also recommend uh, that people who are prone to swimmer's ear to consider it and people who have had their eardrums repaired or have had previous perforations uh, because their eardrums may not be as strong and having that little bit of extra support uh, is useful. So there you are, Docs Pro Plugs. Um, if you don't remember the information on the slide, no problem. You can just look, Google Pro Plugs, and you'll find it distributed near you. I see a hand there, Mornay, so just yes, chip in for me. Just to let you know, I have shared um, all the links so far uh, with uh, the different participants on Zoom and uh, via Facebook. So they have the links to SwimSeal, uh, the YouTube channels, and now also the ProPlex, the, the general site, the one that uh, people can find um, uh, distributed within uh, uh, Southern Africa. And then also for the Europeans, uh, there's a distributor there uh, or a link to that. So uh, just so that you're aware of that, uh, Dr. Kunya. Oh, great stuff, Mornay. Thank you for that. And uh, one of the things I'd, I'd like to say is, and I, I'll sound like a female chauvinist if, if you understand what I mean, in that women tend to look after these plugs better than males <laughs> often do. Uh, the, the task force had lost half the plugs, you know, within the first week and wanted replacements. Um, okay. But there is a little lanyard that is actually meant, uh, you know, so you can allow it to, ha hang, uh, to hang around your neck in between dives, you know. So they do cost something, so you don't want to lose them on every dive. Uh, so make use of that. Yes. Morning. Well, I've actually, when, when I was still running dive uh, outfits in Mozambique, uh, Dr. Crenier, uh, I mean, I wouldn't see many divers with them, but I surely did see, uh, you know, every now and again, there would be folks with them. And what I found the divers really enjoyed is on the boat ride back, especially on the long, windy uh, drives, uh, they would plug them back in the air and that would also help without, uh, you know, to, to protect the ears a little bit. So uh, multifunction use, uh, I guess, at the end of the day. You know, that's a neat thing that I've never thought about, Mornay, and you're absolutely right. In fact, it actually has a rating. There, there is a rating of uh, sound attenuation. So these plugs actually do reduce noise. Not enough for most commercial uh, applications, the fenestrated ones, the ones divers would use, but it, it drops down about uh, 15 decibels which can make a big difference. And of course, wind okay. chill and all of those other facts as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. But full earplugs, uh, no, you shouldn't wear those because then uh, that's what you might have. This was what I mentioned earlier, which is the exostoses. These are the growths. Uh, it doesn't matter to know that really. This is a, a, a small tumor of bone. It's not malignant. It's benign. Uh, it's very uncommon to have malignant bone tu tumors uh, in the external ear, and these are exostoses. So those develop in response to chronic exposure to water below 15 degrees centigrade or just a, a lot of swimming in, in, in temperate water. Um, and uh, usually you find the exostoses below and above and the tumors in the front and the back. And does that make a difference? Absolutely not at all. Uh, what, it, what it does do is it sometimes forces us to look in one area of the eardrum, which is least likely to, uh, uh, to be blocked or to be blocked off from vision to see the eardrum clear. Now it may look terrible, but I can tell you that it usually isn't a major problem. Uh, if, if you've got earplugs and uh, you go surfing and you protect your ears, it's a good idea. It's a, certainly a way of uh, avoiding 
the development of these um, uh, uh, exostoses or osteomata, uh, wearing a hoodie, helmet, or, and I'll talk about that just now, the pro-ear mask, um, wearing earplugs with swimming, those are all ways that you can actually avoid this uh, happening with you. The treatment, uh, the treatment I'd only recommend if you can't hear properly anymore. Uh, there's such a buildup of wax and you have to have your ears irrigated regularly uh, and, or you suffer hearing loss just because of this narrowed canal. In that case, it can be removed. Go to an ENT that chisels it out not someone who drills it out because uh, the drilling procedure can actually damage the inner ear. Fortunately, most ENTs nowadays are familiar with that. Go ahead, Mornay. So <clears throat> with this uh, condition, I, in my uh, left ear, I actually have one of these that stick out. And, you know, when you want to clean your ears, I know you said no uh, pencils, uh, things like that, and earbuds in the <laughs> ear. But um, it is quite sensitive at times. So if you nick it, then, you know, you get a little bit of a... Uh, a jerk, but um, I remember ooh, most probably five plus years ago uh, at one of the Cape Town dive festivals. Um, the, uh, the current uh, Dan Southern Africa medical director, Dr. Jack Mankies, he was attending there and he did a couple of lectures, and in, uh, he also had the video otoscope there and uh, yeah. it caught on very quickly. So quite a lot of the commercial divers came around as well, and obviously they had loads of uh, the, you know these bony outgrowths. And with that, quite a lot of wax buildup because I guess it gets stuck behind the bony outgrowth, especially if you're diving in uh, cold water for an extended period and so forth. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd just share that story with you while you're on this slide. Now, that's great. Thank, thanks for that, Mornay. And um, I hope you're catching some of the, the um, uh, comments that are coming through chat. And again, if, if you think uh, there's a, an appropriate point to, to actually respond to that, please feel free just to uh, uh, hold up your hand and, uh, and then I'll uh, try and deal with, with that. At the moment, you know, I'm managing between two screens and believe it or not, uh, that's quite a feat. <laughs> so more well, that, again, yeah. here's to you. <laughs> so um, at this stage, we haven't got anybody really asking questions. They just okay. sort of uh, one or two uh, folks have uh, agreed with the swim swirl and mentioned uh, that Dr. Kale uh, also recommended that and uh, yeah. made up a nice paste and so forth. But uh, if anybody out there has questions, you're more than welcome to ask. If not, sounds like you're doing a good job, Dr. Cunha. Okay, good show. Well, this is a picture of a commercial diver and they're diving with a helmet. And the advantage there, of course, is that their ears aren't generally exposed to water uh, and certainly not to the extent that would be the case for most scuba divers. Um, now, scuba divers don't typically dive with helmets, but there is a mask called the Pro Ear Mask developed by an Israeli diving physician that actually developed these cups that fit over the ear are linked to the mask itself. So when you equalize the mask by exhaling into it, it automatically equalizes this airspace as well. And the benefit is that it keeps your ear canal dry. And uh, some people say that they can, they can distinguish the direction of sound underwater. I haven't tested that for myself. And I, I must say, I, I'm not quite sure that's the case. Uh, if someone wants to chat and say that they found that, please do. Um, but remember that even if you wear these, you'll still need to equalize because the pressure will still be exerted on the eardrum. The only benefit is you'll now have dry ear canals. So the chances of developing an external ear infection is much, much lower. Uh, here's a more modern version of it. Um, readily available on Amazon and probably take a lot. Um, it, it's not difficult to get hold of. Uh, it, it may not be the greatest fashion statement, although I must say the divers that dive with these have been very, very happy on the whole. So uh, it's something to consider if you battle with uh, external otitis. Okay. I'm going to move to middle ear barotrauma just because I want to get into the equalizing techniques. 
And this is one of the things that I do. That's an otoscope that you uh, see me putting into the diver's ear. And what, I'm, what I'll ask them to do is to equalize. And when they do, this is what I'm looking at. I'm looking at their ear. This is, a, this is actually part of the, the hammer, which is one of the little bones of the ear. Uh, this big bobble over there called the lateral process is really useful because when you're looking at a gunky ear, and you'll see one in a moment, uh, that's a way to find out where on earth you are. But this part of the eardrum is where you usually see the most mo movement. And uh, that's one of the ways we can actually check verify that a person is able to equalize okay so remember that the eardrum is just like a window to the middle ear the middle ear actually contains uh, a, about um, 60 mils of airspace and uh, people who do those really really deep dives to 200 meters or so actually flood their middle ear with uh, with saline before they go diving. Now, I don't recommend you should do it, but I'm just telling you that the people that do those extreme depth dives actually flood their middle ear with water or saline so that they don't have uh, the need to empty their lungs to keep equalizing. Isn't that extraordinary? Anyway, that's one of the things divers do. Okay, this is the uh, middle ear look. Look, looking at it um, sort of as a cutaway, and you can see the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And there may be some of you, or there may be a question about um, can you dive off a stapedectomy? And what a stapedectomy is, is if a person gets this part of the ear um, that actually attaches and actually forms a little bony connection and uh, dampens sound transfer into the ear, this is sometimes removed, and they put a little piston in its place. And until two years ago, there was an absolute standing, uh, I would call it a standing rule, that if you've had a stapedectomy, you can't dive. Well, guess what? A study was done. A bunch of divers actually did dive. They dove with stapedectomies without anybody's permission, which often happens, and they actually were able to equalize, and none of them had difficulties. So it's not to say that if you've had a stapedectomy that you can't dive. So I just want to, maybe it's meaningful to someone out there um, that has had a stapedectomy, uh, it may be possible to continue diving. Okay. Now, the amount of pressure it takes for you to feel it on the eardrum is about a snorkel's um, depth, if you like, about 30 centimeters of water, you'll feel pressure on the eardrum. If you're at sea level, it's about 10 stories in an elevator. That, that's just the threshold for detection. It takes about the same amount of pressure to open the eustachian tube actively. Um, obviously, if you've got swelling, it may be more, but it shouldn't take more than about uh, the, um, uh, the amount of pressure to clear a snorkel uh, in order to equalize. If, however, you have descended too rapidly, then what happens is this eustachian tube actually kinks. And just like a kink straw, it doesn't matter how hard you blow, it's not going to open. You have to ascend and get the eustachian tube straight again so that you're able to equalize. Uh, if you continue diving and uh, you aren't able to equalize, somewhere between five and 10 meters, your eardrum's gonna rupture, unless you've got a really, really tough eardrum, uh, which may be the result of, for instance, a tuberculous infection of the ear. We've had that. People that have, almost have leather-like ears, but that's the exception. Um, so if you've, had, if you've got someone that comes to you and says, well, they were able to dive to 15 or 20 meters, um, they've been able to equalize unless they developed a perforation. Now, I'm going to give you a unique view that few people have the uh, privilege of seeing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you in the direction of this arrow. So you're looking up at the nostrils over here. And I'm going to take you through 
past the teeth, hard palate, soft palate, and you're going to be looking upwards here to the eustachian tube opening. So we're going to do that, and you're going to look up. All right, so here we go. Hard palate, soft palate, that was the uh, little tongiki, the little tongue. This is the nasal septum, the bone that separates the two sides of the nose. And what you're looking at here and here is called the torus tuberius or the, the mound of the tube. And this and that is the actual opening of the eustachian tube. So that's where you're actually blowing through in order to equalize. And it's very easy to see how a bit of mucus buildup, how a bit of an infection, how a skew septum in certain cases, um, or as people who have had their adenoids removed, sometimes have scarring and they have difficulty equalizing. So that's just something to be aware of because that's relevant to, uh, to some divers. Okay. Now I'm going to just quickly go through some equalizing techniques because it is relevant and divers don't necessarily get the opportunity to, uh, to practice them. And we're going to do pop quizzes just to see how well you do. I'm going to start off with this by saying that, uh, and I, I don't know, our audience typically for a webinar is, um, is a, an experienced audience, but there may be some novices. And I can tell you that the experience of equalizing the ear isn't a normal feeling. If people equalize, you know, they usually want to sort of wheel the jaw and get the pressure back down again. So it really isn't a normal feeling. And uh, people as adults who somehow have a bit of a fear of equalizing often had problems with their ears as children and had grommets placed or had surgery. So it's something that you need to just be aware of if you're an instructor, that someone who, who is really squeamish about equalizing may be someone who's just nervous, but it may be someone who had problems, um, equalize, uh, problems equalizing the ears due to infections um, as a child and had grommets or surgery. And then, of course, we give all these uh, strange instructions, not blowing too hard, you've blown too hard, etc., etc. It's important to tell people how hard they should blow. No more than it would take to inflate a large balloon or empty a snorkel. At least that gives people an, a sense of how hard they should blow. You're not blowing hard enough? Well, I've addressed that. You've over-equalized, which basically means you have equalized so that your eardrum is now bulging outwards. So it's going to take a while for the water to actually press it back inwards for you to actually feel yourself equalizing again. And that's something that divers need to be aware of. You can equalize to the point where your eardrum now bulges outwards and it takes a while before it actually gets to the point that you will feel it equalizing again. And then lastly, of course, you don't want to pinch your nose and blow during ascent because that is breath holding. Okay. Again, a bit of a warning here. If people are squeamish about their ears, they're sometimes squeamish about diving. So those are the ones you want to really reassure and make sure, make sure that they um, get to equalize easily. Uh, try the uh, Docs Pro Plugs or the pro ear mask, um, or certainly find the best way for them to equalize. And that's the next thing we're going to cover. We're going to go through a couple of techniques, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but I'd like to actually get a sense of how many of you manage with different forms of equalizing. And I'm going to start with the first one. And this is the one we do mostly. I hope uh, most of you aren't yawning, but uh, chewing or swallowing, maybe you're drinking some coffee or, or hot chocolate while you're watching this. And if you are, just a quick pop quiz. I'd like to know, just poll there, how many of you could notice something happening in your middle ear when you were swallowing 
or you can swallow now. Don't pinch your nose, just swallow. Okay, so that is at this stage almost 60%. Okay, so there are a couple of people that don't experience that. It's not uncommon. Okay, so many people were able to feel a change in their ears when they were swallowing, and that is the normal way our middle ear maintains pressure uh, that is just about the same as atmospheric. But there is a 12% group here that didn't feel anything. And these individuals may need to find active ways to equalize. So just bear that in mind. Um, uh, it, it's not necessarily going to be uh, a, a, a simple matter uh, of swallowing to equalize. And by the way, swallowing in order to equalize while diving doesn't work that well because you end up swallowing a lot of air and then your stomach distends and you actually sort of get this, this uncomfortable uh, bloated stomach under your weight belt uh, because you've been swallowing air. So we don't recommend this as a technique for equalizing to dive, but it does give you a sense of whether people's ears are okay. All right, so we've got about an 88, 12% split here. Now we're going to go to the next one. And this is the people, uh, the people that we're all very envious of. And that is the people who are able to literally, voluntarily open their Eustachian tubes. Now, it's very, very hard to teach, but basically, the, the best description I can give is it's like giving a, a yawn in polite conversation. So it's sort of a strangled yawn <laughs> at the back of your throat or saying hmm or k at the back of your throat while holding uh, your nose shut, shutting your nose, doing that, and then sensing whether your ears equalize or not. So I'm going to, again, as we did before, give you the pop quiz and ask how many of you are actively able to equalize your ears by twitching your stachian tubes. It's usually about 10%. So let's see how it shakes out with the 45 people we have on board. Okay. So in this case, let's see the polls are coming in. Okay, so it's about 41% of people that can actively equalize by manipulating their stachian tubes voluntarily. Blessed, you should consider yourselves. And for the uh, mortals that mentioned no, don't give up or lose heart because we're going to show you ways uh, to equalize. It is the exception to actually uh, be able to uh, equalize your ears voluntarily okay all right so let's look at the next one and that is the one that is usually taught to divers that begin diving the valsalva technique and what you're doing with the valsalva technique is you're pinching the blood uh, the nose and blowing against the blocked nose so that air goes up the eustachian tube now, you shouldn't need to blow harder than it takes to clear a snorkel or fill a large balloon. And we're going to do the pop quiz again. But before we get there, please don't blow more than about five seconds. There's a reason for that. If you're blowing more than five seconds, there's probably a mechanical reason why you're not able to equalize. And you may need to ascend. So that's one. And two is, if you, if you blow for more than five seconds especially if you blow hard, it actually changes your heartbeat and it, it can cause uh, people to faint. It can cause um, uh, holes in the heart pattern for Ramana Vales to open. Um, it can cause a lot of changes in your, your heart rate and uh, distribution of blood. So don't force your ears. So with that, let's move to the pop quiz and let's find out how many of you are able to valve salva. 
I'm going to give you a bit of a chance before I, I mention what I'd like to answer answered with the second one. You're welcome to start answering it already. But the first one is, how many of you are able to Valsalva? Pinch and blow and equalize. Okay. Now, what I want to ask now is for those people that equalized with the Valsalva technique, how many of you found that the one ear equalizes slightly faster than the other and can you believe it it's about 80 percent of divers so 80 80 81 percent of our audience find that the one ear clears more quickly or easily than the other two reasons for that mostly either the eustachian tube or because the one eardrum is stiffer than the other now, here's the trick. And Mona, have we given the Facebook folks uh, enough time? Uh, yes, um, it's fine. We can continue. Okay. Well, this is very, very helpful. And I see the, the no here with the Valsalva. I really hope the person who answered no will have an answer by the end of the evening. But what I'd like you to do now on the next slide is to tilt your head. Now, it's not just leaning on your side it's literally bending your head to the side so that this strap muscle the sternocleidoid muscle that links this little bone behind your ear to your collarbone it must stretch a bit and then i'd like you to put the slow ear in other words the ear that didn't want to equalize as quickly as the other one i'd like that ear to point upwards and after you've done that, I'd like you to Valsalva and to see whether there's a difference when you've done that. So just to get everybody on the same baseline, wheel the jaw just, uh, you know, get the ears at the same sort of pressure. <laughs> and then what I'd like you to do is tilt your head so that the slow ear points up. You stretch the, uh, you stretch the muscle over here. Okay, right side there. And what I'd like to do with the pop quiz is I'd like you to answer whether you noticed whether it was easier, felt the same, or whether there was no difference whatsoever. Now look at that. Mm. That's fascinating. This is... this. Mornay, this is this is brilliant. We we need yeah. to do a whole host of things. I mean, <laughs> can you uh, easy design wetsuits? I mean, it's th these poles are great. Okay, they so are. well, they they. I don't know if this uh, confirms maybe um, uh, over the years your experience uh, dealing with calls via the hotline and so forth. But I know from you know speaking to the the agents and some of the other dive doctors that. Quite often, as you're saying, uh, new students to diving uh, tend to keep uh, equalizing and force it for too long. And then they end up no. with some kind of barotrauma um, and, you know, they get skittish and so forth. And um, I don't know, that seems to be what you're saying here, you know, that uh, might yeah. be the cause. And hopefully through some of this advice, uh, one can, you know, try and avoid it. I, I particularly like the fact that you said don't blow for more than five seconds and use a normal party balloon because that gives you a nice sort of visual and blowing and, and time frame in which you can actually successfully equalize. And if you don't get it right, I guess give it a break and start again. Now, the statistics we're looking at here are very important. 76% uh, said that they found it easier. Okay, so that the ear pointing upwards equalized easier. So that's something that would be really meaningful to you. Amongst those that said the same <clears throat> may include people who actually found that previously the ears had a difference, but when they tilted their ear upwards, it was now the same. So mm. I, I can't, you know, I can't nuance that from, from the way we posed the question, 
but it's quite common for people who have a difference when their heads are sort of flush, when they tilt their heads, the ears now equalize in the same way. Not necessarily easier, but the same. So easy or the same may actually include the same people. Only 7%, which is a very important number, found that there was no difference. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't equalize. It may be that they could equalize easily on both sides. So uh, this is a very, very encouraging statistic. Uh, and it certainly shows the benefit of, uh, of tilting the head, if anything else. Mm. Okay. Now, for those of you that struggle with Valsalva, I want to give you a technique or try and describe a technique. And it, I must say it's a little bit difficult to, to illustrate but basically, it derives from the Second World War. And what happened with the Stuka pilots, because of the rapid descent when they were bombing, is the pilots had to find a technique to equalize really quickly. And a flight surgeon, Herman Frenzel, actually taught them, while they were wearing an oronasal mask, which was closing the nose, to bulge their tongue against the soft palate. So the right at the back. It's like saying hmm or k while keeping the nose closed. For what it's worth, you know, you may have heard my ooh sound, but it's sort of a squeak. It's not the same as a valsalva because you're not closing your glottis. You're blowing directly from your, from your lungs or and moving the soft palate. Okay. So... I'd like to know, with that, how you experienced this particular technique. How many of you found it easier with the friends? Of, yep. This, this I'd really like to see because I have a theory here, and the theory seems to be bearing itself out. I'll tell you the theory, seeing, seeing I, I can almost not be wrong. I nearly have all the polls in. But I've found that about 50% of people who struggle to Valsalva do great with Frenzel. But the Frenzel technique is almost never taught in regular dive training. So it's something that I hope is meaningful for you tonight. It's something to, to practice, to exercise, to, to really get to master with the regulator in the mouth. But believe it or not, some people just frenzel easier than Valsalva. And it's a gentler technique. It's a safer technique. And it's actually a better technique, if I have to be honest. So I'm really, really pleased with the uh, 30, um, 34% that, that said that the frenzel uh, was actually easier, which is a surprising finding because with a Valsalva, you can sort of force it a little bit, blow harder. Uh, but if you were doing the Frenzel right, you weren't actually really pressurizing. You were just using your soft palate. So that's really cool. Okay, have we got the Facebook people in? Yes. Uh, let me just share the results there. 33% um, said yes and 67% said no. Amazing, eh? So we can actually quote this now about a third Frenzel more easily than Valsalva. So if you're an mm. instructor, you would actually now be able to tell your students, based on this poll, that about a third of people will do better with this tongue technique that I was just showing you than the simple pinch and blow. And that's powerful information, okay? that you wouldn't have come about if you weren't part of tonight's seminar. So you're building diving mm. medicine, guys. <laughs> I want to uh, make you feel really excited about what we're doing here. Okay. Now, here's the next one I'd like you to try. It requires a little bit of uh, um, coordination. But what I'd like you to do first is, you know, get the ears, just wiggle your jaw so that both ears are more or less back to uh, baseline if you'd like to call it that. <laughs> and what I'd like so you I, to do now, 
Yo, yo. So, uh, Dr. Cronier, possibly just yo. look at the uh, latest comment that came in. I think that's oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> a very interesting one and uh, yeah, it just shows that divers are really missing uh, being submerged. But uh, anyways, I thought it would make for a good laugh. <laughs> Okay, well, 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 I agree, guys, and and I'm sorry that if talking about diving actually makes you <laughs> realize how much you miss it, because that's not what we want to do. We want to make sure that when you get back to diving, that uh, you know you have fewer problems. So I hope that's the attitude that we can project. But anyway, what I'd like you to do now is to pinch your nose and blow against it, but not as hard as you would. To Valsalva. So you just blow a little bit and then try and swallow. It sometimes helps to you sort of sort of get mm, mm, you know a little bit of spit ready so you uh, ready to put it down the hatch when you need to but you then pinch blow slightly at swallow. And what I'd like to know now after doing that is how many of you found that that was a powerful technique, a strong technique. <laughs> okay, polls coming in. I love it. It's amazing. As you swallow, I, I guess first get a nice spitball in the mouth, pinch and then swallow. <laughs> um, you can actually feel how the eardrums almost suck down uh, um, yeah. sort of towards your shoulders in a way. Yeah. That's right, as you, as you were pointing out. Now look at this, eh? 79% um, said, "Woo, okay, it was a lot more powerful than before. There are a couple of people that said it wasn't. I don't know whether it means they can't equalize yet or there wasn't really a difference. Can't make that distinction. But again, mm -hmm. instructors, where this is valuable is not going to be in the water. Where this is going to be valuable to you is in the classroom. Because in the classroom, you'd be able to do this. With a regulator in the mouth, you know, with a spit and all of that, it's going to be too difficult to do. But if a person is able to equalize with this technique, it means the eustachian tubes are normal and the rest is practice. So that can be an enormous confidence builder for those of you instructors, instructor trainers, or just, uh, you know, divers, um, talking to your dive buddy, you can use this information and you can have them experience the equalization. And another thing is you can use this technique while you're still on the boat before you get in the water to give yourself a little bit of a head start, which also sometimes helps divers quite a lot. Okay, have we got the Facebook uh, gang covered? Yes. Yes, it's 50 50 uh, from uh, via the Facebook side. Okay, that's interesting that it's slightly different. But uh, mm. the swallowing and blowing, certainly the, the ones predominantly uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the Zoom list were, were saying that it was quite powerful. Okay, mm. now here's a technique, the next one, which for some strange reason we don't teach. And it is one of the most powerful techniques that there are. Carl Edmonds is a well-known diving physician who passed away quite recently. And what you're doing here is you are jutting the jaw forward. Now, I'm going to turn to the side without trying to, you know, knock my computer silly. Okay. So, I'm going to jut my jaw forward like this. And then I'm going to ask you to equalize using any technique you did before. So, Draw forward and equalize. Okay, so now we're getting to the pop quiz and the questions there. How many of you found it helped to move it forward? Boom, 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 boom. Love it. Yeah. Ah, okay, one or two no's. <laughs> if, if, yeah. if, if if at the end any of those no's mean people who struggle to equalize they must please yeah. email us yeah. because we'd like to help them one way or the other but uh, but yeah. isn't it amazing that 89 percent 
that I have here. I don't know how many you have on Facebook, but 89% of divers found that this technique, which you can do easily with a regulator in your mouth, actually mm. opens up the first third of the eustachian tube. And what you might have noticed is that the pitch of equalizing was a bit higher mm. because you were stiffening the eustachian tube a little bit, making it more straight. You were opening the first third and what you may have noticed is higher pitch and shorter duration. So instead of a whoop, it would have been a whip. And that's because you are making it easier to equalize. And that's a technique that we almost never teach. And it is a profoundly effective technique. Okay, cool guys. Uh, thanks so much for, for participating in the polls. I'm enjoying this no end. I hope you are enjoying it as much as I am, but I'm really, really enjoying this because you're giving me some figures that we can actually put out there. I mean, this, this is an article uh, uh, in the making, uh, Mornay, that we, yeah. we should put out. Okay. So we, now, got a, we, got a, we got a few uh, um, bits and bobs uh, feedback. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Let me just see. Jutting the jaw, overkill, hence, no, I don't do that. So that's fine. Hey, it, uh, is it normal that um, practicing uh, equalizing ears should be painful? So if, uh, you, if you do that. Well, uh, I, I think just using common sense, if doing something hurts, it's probably not a really good thing with the exception mm. of certain forms of exercise. But exercising, equalizing the ears to a point that it's painful means that you're probably overdoing it one way or the other. You'll have to figure out how, and maybe you can put that in an email to us and we can try and tease out uh, why it becomes painful, but it shouldn't. Uh, it, it, it shouldn't be uh, painful at all. In fact, if anything, you should actually experience a certain amount of relief because your eardrums are continually being sucked inwards. Your middle ear contains active cells that absorb oxygen so you are continually losing that 20 percent as the living cells use the oxygen in the middle ear so equalizing by yawning swallowing or whatever should actually give you a slight bit of relief and you might notice that oh i can actually hear better and it's true because you have made your eardrum more compliant okay is there anything I need to attend to more now or are we good? Um, there are a couple of things that came through. Let me just have a look here. Uh, often when I can't equalize, I just jiggle my jaw. Uh, I guess it speaks to one of the techniques. I also jiggle my jaw. Great webinar. This is something that I would look back on again and again. All right. Oh, uh, I, really had, I really had a, oh, hang on. I really had a big issue with my left ear. I really need to see the doctor, um, Dr. Cronier. So, okay, well, I don't know where you are, Lerato, but uh, if you're down in Cape Town, I guess you could go visit him. Otherwise, give us a shot, you know. Um, either use the email I shared earlier or make use of the Dan hotline um, or just, you know, ask me to get in touch and we can put you uh, in touch with some of the dive docs in your area. Wiggling my jaw does it for me too. Uh, agree. Um, and uh, what's it? And share with my mates who battle. Okay, so the wiggle, the jaw wiggling seems to be uh, quite a good one. He has a question okay. from Jay. Uh, I can't equalize on the surface easily, but uh, cannot. Uh, well, it seems like he struggles, if I understand correctly, uh, from the surface down to 10 meters. He seems to have an oh. issue there. Um, I'm sure you can uh, answer that. Um, wish I saw this before my training this morning. Okay. <laughs> this was real and real is uh, all the way from uh, the garden route. Uh, very fortunate because they've managed to uh, get divers in the water in their area uh, during lockdown. So they've been doing quite a bit of open water training and so forth. So I'm sure this is quite useful to you. Uh, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Doc and Mornay, for uh, the overload of info. Much appreciated. That's from James. Great presentation. Thanks, Doc. Um, hopefully, everybody's still on board. It looks like it. So, okay. Well, there we go. Let's continue. Well, Lorato, the next slide is just for you because what I want to do is I want to show you one of two things that may make all the difference for you. And the yeah. first one is the Otovent. 
Uh-huh. Now, what the out event is, are, are we good still, Mornay? Good? Mm-hmm. Okay. What the out event is, and, and here's the, the link if you want to find it on the internet or you can just do a search on the out event, is you've got a nozzle, polyethylene nozzle that's got a hole that's through there. And these are calibrated balloons, but, but if you have a large party balloon, that'll work okay as long as you've softened it up first. So make sure that you blow it up with your mouth first before um, blowing it up uh, through the nose. I actually once looked at a, a diver's ears; they were inflating the balloon and could actually see that the eardrum, <laughs> that, that there were small bleeds. So I don't advocate f- uh, fr- new balloons being blown up um, directly via the nose. Use your mouth first so that you soften the balloon. Now, second step. What you're seeing over here is the person's holding that little nostril or this little bobble sphere against the nostril, closing off the other nostril, and they are either inflating the the, the, uh, pre or prepared balloon through the nose, which, by the way, gives you an idea of how hard you should blow, which is really useful, especially as an instructor. It's something that you can look at and you can see, okay, the guy's really trying and he's really battling. Okay, so that's step one. You, you inflate. The second option is you can actually inflate this balloon with your mouth and then you can just literally bend that little steel key, that, that little stem over there over there you just literally bend it down so you've still got air in your balloon and then keeping it in the nostril you allow the air to to deflate through the nose while you swallow it sometimes helps to just take a a sip of water before you do this so you've got a balloon that's pre-inflated and you now swallow, 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 as the balloon goes down. And what that does, it actually exercises the eustachian tubes. So for the person who said that they developed pain as a result of uh, ear clearing, or Lorato, in your case, maybe if you've got one ear that's a bit of a battle, this might be a solution for you. Because Mm -hmm. I found that and, and there, there was quite a large number of people who indicated that they had used decongestants to equalize. Mm-hmm. We found that people that have, have practiced using this three times a day, I mean, you can do it somewhere uh, out of okay. public sight, you know, <clears throat> you know, just inflate the balloon, one side, swallow, 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 other side, swallow, 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 three times a day for a week. And we found that the effect is at least at least as good, if not better, than Sudafed. And the reason for that is that that exercising uh, technique that this actually causes releases what we call surfactant. Now, surfactant is a fancy name for soap. It's the body's soap or anti-sticky stuff. It releases a, a, a layer that makes it easier for the eustachian tube to open. So you're actually exercising and rehabilitating, optimizing and exercising your stake in tube. So that's something that I'd really, really like you to try if you can get your hands on those. You'll probably be able to order it through Take A Lot or, uh, you know, one of the usual channels. Okay. It's really, really worth a try. And for another group that maybe struggles, this is an option. Now, there are many different versions of sinus rinse or sino rinse or naso rinse, you know, all kinds of names. The one I, I really like because of the shape of the bottle and the shape of the nozzle uh, is the sinus rinse. I haven't got shares in them, <laughs> so I'm not promoting for my own interest. Uh, but if you can get your, your hands on this, it's really, really good. I'm going to show you a video clip how this works. 
you fill the bottle with uh, with saline they're, they're sachets you can see them over there you fill it with uh, lukewarm uh, water that's cooled down after you boiled it so it's sterile you mix the solution and then what you do is as follows and this is obviously an amateur person doing it i thought i wouldn't show you the the commercial one so you can see what it will really look like so that what's happening is the saline's actually going up the one nose and coming down the other but you'll notice towards the end and i know it's a bit gross but <laughs> towards the end you you actually see some mucus coming out and that mucus was over the openings of the estaken tube so by doing this you've actually removed the mucus that may have been blocking your ability to equalize. It's a great technique. It's a great facilitator. And I found that I would say at least 13% of people that come to me that say that they've tried everything. They've gone to see ENTs, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, and I uh, explain either the otovent or the sinus rinse and we get that solved. So that makes a big difference. And those of you that, that say there's a bit of a, they have a curtain behind the back of their throat in the mornings, you know, they are the guys that will really benefit. Mornay, was that your hand that you raised? Yes, I did. And I think you'll answer this question when you get uh, towards the end of the presentation, but it's one by Facebook. It says that, um, I'm just trying to uh, just get the first part of the question. Um, uh, okay, something with sinus equalizing was uh, the first part of it, but he comes back. Sometimes he, he experiences pain, uh, you know, uh, by, uh, at the back of the eyes, I assume, due to oh, sinus yes. equalizing issues. You know, no pain in the ears, but the, the eyes or the sinuses. And I think okay. uh, this is uh, um, Odif, if I've uh, uh, pronounced your name correctly. Um, as far as I know, Dr. Cronier will get to that, uh, you know, a couple of slides on. And if we don't answer your question, remember, get all of us uh, in, in any number of ways. Just uh, get your question answered. Okay, so we're going to move on now to the next. And this is um, a list of things that you can do to make your life easier in terms of equalizing overall. The first and most obvious thing that you can do is avoiding milk products for 48 hours. Now, most of you that, that uh, have maybe been following the health channels have um, heard that you, you cut out gluten, you cut out dairy. I forget what the third thing is that, that, that you cut out um, in, in trying to uh, get your gut and get things going uh, uh, better. I can tell you the milk uh, issue has been known for years. It's been, it's been common knowledge amongst doctors that if people have head colds, they must avoid milk because it actually thickens the mucus, okay? So avoid milk for 48 hours before you go diving. It can make an enormous difference. Vasomotor rhinitis is a fancy way of saying, and the cold feet isn't fear here. These are individuals, if they put their feet down on, on uh, a cold surface will sometimes sneeze or just before it rains, they'll find the nose closes. These are individuals that often do very well with decongestant sprays. Okay, I'll talk about the sprays just now. Just remember this vasomotor rhinitis. Okay, so that works very well with topical sprays. Obstructions, obviously, if there's something mechanical, it may be, need to be surgically managed. You can avoid um, a lot of equalizing problems by not smoking, um, and certainly not smoking uh, shortly before diving. And if you, if you have a head cold, we advise that you don't uh, dive if, if the infection is causing the problem. And then another reason that people sometimes struggle to equalize is they have used decongestants for too long. And what happens then is that the, the eustachian tubes uh, and the blood vessels basically just say, we've had enough. And what happens is you get rebound congestion. 
and it actually makes it worse. So people, they need to decondi decondition a bit um, to uh, just uh, get back to a normal estate in tube function. Okay, so those are simple ways uh, in which you can make it easier and avoid common problems. And that brings us, uh, Mornay, to your part of ship and the lucky draw. And well, it's not. This is. It's not. not yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, it's not quite the lucky draw, uh, but I know you still got a couple of slides. But it's just a reminder uh, to stick around till the end when we'll do the lucky draw for uh, two people that registered via the Zoom link. Uh, one will win a, a Dan hoodie, the black part uh, one there. And uh, another person can stand a chance to win uh, one of those red jackets. So that's quite nice. But wow, so far it's been a great webinar. We've got uh, pretty much all the, the folks that joined from the start with maybe one or two that dropped off. And uh, the same uh, on the Facebook side. So, so far so good. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Maybe just give us a thumbs up or a yes uh, on, on the toggle there. Uh, let us know if you still enjoy it. Would you like us to go faster? Are you happy with the pace? But so far, I think it's great. Okay. Oh, well, thanks for that, Mornay. Yes, and indeed, the next, uh, the next issue that we're going to address is the issue of Sudafed. Now, Sudafed nowadays you can't buy on its own. And technically, you shouldn't be taking Sudafed to dive. If you decide to take Sudafed and dive, which we don't generally recommend, I'll show you uh, my approach uh, on the next slide. But if you do need to make a choice and you don't want to get a doctor's script for uh, pseudoephedrine, pure pseudoephedrine, get the combination with paracetamol. There are uh, combinations with codeine, uh, combinations with uh, ibuprofen and there are combinations with paracetamol or acetaminophen if you in in, in North America so that version um, is the least likely to give you hassles and you'll be able to take two of those and the effect lasts for four hours okay so just be aware of that and then the uh, nasal uh, spray there are any numbers of, of different sprays. In South Africa, Drixine is a very, very, um, I would say it's good value, uh, but there's Iliadin, there are many others that you can choose from, and, uh, and they work, and we'll show how you should use them in a moment. Okay, so here is how I deal with pseudoephedrine. When I don't use it, when I say, uh-uh, don't use pseudofed, is if you can't equalize at all, or you've got an infection, then you don't use equalize, uh, you don't use Sudafed in order to equalize because you are going to either injure your ears or you can actually injure your lungs because an upper respiratory infection, as we found with COVID, is it sometimes affects the lungs as well. So the ears sometimes the safety net for the lungs. Don't use it for the first time when you go diving. And that's true for anything, whether it's for, for high blood pressure or any other medication. You don't use it for the first time while diving. You first need to find out whether you have side effects. If you don't have side effects, well, then you can consider diving. Please don't exceed twice 60 milligrams of pseudoephedrine per day. Reason for that is you get rapid heart rate. And the other thing that you get, apart from anxiety, is you can actually cause a complete obstruction of urine. In other words, your bladder, you can't pass urine. We've had people that have had total obstruction of urine as a result of using Sudafed. So that's something that you definitely don't want to do. Don't use it more than four to five days. Um, and uh, be aware of the contraindications. Uh, if people are already a bit uh, anxious, not a good thing to add. If they've got heart conditions, not a good thing to add. And if they've got prostate problems or urine problems, not a good thing to add. Sudafed is going to make it worse. Uh, studies have shown that it doesn't seem to increase uh, oxygen-related seizures, but we still recommend that you don't combine 
uh, pseudoephedrine if you diving on nitrox or you're decompressing on oxygen. So when will I c consider using it? Well, I'll use it if someone finds that the one ear is really just a lot slower than the other. We'll try the head tilt, but if that isn't enough, sometimes that little bit of decongestion just gives them the confidence and they're then able to get that sorted out. I also might consider it the lesser of the evils if people suffer from alternobaric vertigo, and I'm going to be describing what that is a little bit later. And the last one is, if someone had a bad experience diving and they injured their ears, then what I will say is, why don't you try Sudafed and just go and practice in the pool? Find me the pool and go and practice equalizing because then you can get your confidence back. So those are really the places where I would consider using uh, uh, pseudoephedrine, uh, yeah, certainly in combination. Now, if you're using topicals and you're using it to make it easier to equalize, this circle indicates what you're aiming for. So how are you going to get there? Well, spraying upwards here is not going to get there. So what you need to do is you need to lie on your back with your head tilted backwards, blow your nose before the time so you, the mucus is removed, then put one or two to three maximum drops per nostril. If you do more than that, it actually has the same effect as Sudafed. You leave your head straight backwards for one minute, then tilt it to the left or the right. It doesn't matter which one first. A minute either side and you blow the nose again. And that we find has the best effect on opening the Eustachian tube if you are going to use a topical technique. Okay. All right, so we're going to be moving to the inner ear. Mornay, anything that I need to deal with um, so far? No, no, nothing serious. Just uh, some folks would like to know if uh, you're happy to share the slides. Uh, for them, they would like to, yes. to share that with some other folks. So I'm sure I said yes, yes, that yes. shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so inner ear. The inner ear is essentially... Uh, uh, an electromechanical transducer. Now, that's a fancy way to say it's something that's moved that develops an electrical signal that then goes to the brain. And that's true for the ear or the cochlea in this case, as well as the vestibular apparatus. So it, it converts me mechanical energy into electrical energy. And you've got two communications or two, um, let's call it windows is the best description that partially co connect the uh, middle ear with the inner ear. And um, this is why you have both of those. Remember the inner ear is filled with fluid and fluid doesn't compress. So the only way that you can get sound waves into the system is by literally having the one window, oval window, push in and the round window bulge out. That's the only way you can get a net effect of motion, which will then give you the sense of hearing. Okay, so that's why you have the two. This is why you shouldn't force your ears. Because if you, if you blow really hard, there is a connection between the fluid in the brain and the inner ear, and you can literally blow out the round window. Or if you suddenly get the uh, eardrum to snap into position, you can actually rupture the, uh, the round window inward. So you can have an explosive or an implosive injury. Either way, it's not a good thing, okay? So, bottom line, never force your ears. Now we're going to quickly touch on dizziness, and I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios and see if you can identify those, and we'll end off with, sin uh, with sinuses. Uh, we, uh, we've, we've probably got another uh, 20, 20 or so slides to go, but I'll pick up the pace a bit. Okay, so obviously where things happen 
where things happen influences your differential diagnosis or, or uh, the, the, what, what the, the likelihood is. There we go. The likelihood is of what it is. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you scenarios. And the scenarios, I'd like you to pop quiz, guess what the problem was. So here you've got Joe Diver descending six meters. Ears get more and more shots, painful. He has a pop and experiences vertigo for about 30 seconds. That stops after about two minutes. No problems f further with the dive, but they experience a bit of fullness in the, in the left ear and there might be a little bit of uh, stained water or even blood coming from the ear. So, pop quiz. What do you think that is? Is it middle ear barotrauma, in ear barotrauma, or alternobaric vertigo? Yep. They're coming in, coming in, mm -hmm. yep. I must say the this function of Zoom is uh, very handy and it works well. Yes, it does. Okay. Well, the people that said middle ear barotrauma are absolutely right. There is a way that may result in any ear barotrauma, but that's very rare. And that, that's not what we really would expect here. What I'm referring to here is a situation where the person went down as far as they could. The eardrum ruptured. And this is the eardrum from the side. Cold water went from the external ear canal into the middle ear. And it actually caused this horizontal canal to develop a convection current. In other words, an artificial circulation of fluid as a result of temperature difference. And that causes the hallucination of spinning. And the reason why you get that is because of the temperature difference causing that convection current. And the reason why it stops so quickly, typically 10 minutes or less, is because that's how long it takes for, for the water that's here to heat up to body temperature and that convection current to stop. So you've got a hole in the eardrum. You've got the temporary exposure to water here. And afterwards, there may be a bit of drainage. It won't be as dramatic as this. It may be a little bit of blood on the pillow or, or stained fluid. Okay. So just bear in mind, that is the classic presentation of an eardrum perforation. The classic one. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, no, no, it's just uh, Rudolf uh, wants to know if he can take the test over again. <laughs> <laughs> There's more to come. Don't worry. <laughs> you, are, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's do the next one. Okay. So, here we go. Diver descends to 18 meters, struggles with the ears, struggles with the ears, struggles with the right ear, and eventually surfaces with fullness in the right ear, and then sometimes immediately or within the next hour or so, notice that they've lost hearing in the one ear and they have often quite a significant ringing in the ears. Okay, so pop quiz. What are we looking at there? Yeah, it's slowly starting to come in. Yep. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of stop it there. I think we've got the, the, the brunt of the distribution. Okay. Uh, the correct answer is any ear barotrauma without a fistula. I'll explain what a fistula is in a moment, um, but that's the one that is most likely here. 
uh, uh, is the case here. And uh, why that's important is that people need to realize that you can damage the inner ear without rupturing the round or oval window. So you can actually tear some of the fine linings of the inner ear without actually bursting a round or oval window. Middle ear barotrauma is relevant because the person was struggling and they were forcing their ears, so that is correct. Alternobaric vertigo is, is, un, is unlikely to be the cause because it has a different mechanism. And in a ear with fistula usually has more severe symptoms. So uh, you're on the right track, but the symptoms are usually more on the side of tinnitus without a fistula, whereas you have severe vertigo with a fistula. Okay, so let's just summarize the findings there. History of equalizing difficulties, symptoms underwater, although it can sometimes be delayed, but mostly the main symptoms are underwater. And if you look at the middle ear or the eardrum, you will see signs of middle ear barotrauma. But what you're looking at here, the DTV stands for deafness, tinnitus, and vertigo, is that ringing in the ears is much worse than the vertigo. And the vertigo lasts more than 10 minutes. And I'll get back to the 10 minutes because the 10 minutes vertigo has to do with alternobaric vertigo. So that's where that comes in. Okay, so let's go for the next one. We've got two to go. This diver descends 10 meters, forcefully attempts to clear the ear, continues diving, surfaces with profound vertigo, hearing loss, and roaring tinnitus. Okay, I think I've probably made it uh, a bit easier this time. So can we get the polls there? <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty much uh, we're going to see the fistula being a more significant <laughs> A more significant feature and that's correct this is the sort of person that's probably ruptured their round or less likely their oval window okay so this is inner ear with fistula and the history will be that the person forced their ears it happened uh, underwater and there is evidence of middle ear barotrauma but you have profound lasting serious deafness, vertigo, and tinnitus. And the vertigo is profound. These people are really, really dizzy. Okay? Neat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next one. Okay. Oh, I wanted to give you just, just a couple of things. If, if you ever faced with this type of scenario, all you need to remember is you don't want to make the fistula worse. And the most important thing is then to tell people not to carry on Valsalva. You know, sometimes, you know, they feel the fullness in the ear and so on. They try and equalize. They actually are going to leak more fluid out of their inner ear, which is making matters worse. In fact, all the treatments that you see here which is what typically would happen in a hospital, are in order to keep the pressure of the fluid in the brain and therefore in the inner ear low or certainly not elevated. In other words, not making it worse. And if after five days the person isn't really significantly better or they're still deteriorating, then there may be uh, an indication for operation. Okay. So I just want to point out the Valsalva. The stool softness, those of you that were wondering, is that you don't want people, you know, sort of straining uh, on stool. So you want uh, uh, it to be easy for them to pass stool so they're not um, uh, increasing the, uh, the pressure in the skull. Okay. So here's the next one. 24-meter dive. Five meters, they ascend to five meters 
all's fine. Experience a bit of fullness in the right ear. And then vertigo starts. Not tinnitus, not, not hearing loss. Or if there's hearing loss, marginal. But there's vertigo. And the vertigo stops as soon as the fullness in the ear that was affected stops. And it's typically upon surfacing or within 10 minutes being on the boat, and there are no other symptoms. There are no other things that are of concern. It's literally a typical phenomena at the safety stop. So, let's go to the pop quiz. What do you think we're looking at here? We've got, a smart, we've got a smart group. And I want to thank you guys for trying. I mean, even if you get the answers wrong, just I really appreciate you uh, uh, participating. It's, it's very sa satisfying for us. The answer is alternobaric vertigo. Okay, and 83% of the folks... Um, on Zoom said uh, 83%. Uh, Mornay, Facebook, more or less the same? Um, they're still coming in, so I'll let you know, but we can continue. That's fine. Okay. All right. So let me give you the reason why people de develop alternobaric vertigo. What happens is it's really a form of reverse block. In other words, the one ear is unable to discharge air down the eustachian tube relative to the other ear. And what happens is the eardrum bulges out a little bit. In the process, it tugs on the stapes and it causes a rapid discharge of the electromechanical transducers in the vestibular system. So it's really a reverse block, and the reverse block causes a, uh, a distortion of shape, if you like, a distortion of shape of the oval window on the one side relative to the other, stimulating the one vestibular uh, apparatus more than the other, and hence it's alterno, in other words, difference, baric, different, Pressures in the middle ear, vertigo. Okay, has every, every everybody got that? Okay, so that that's classic alternobaric vertigo. And by the way, uh, just just a trick that I'd uh, mention here: if you are in a situation where you have one ear that doesn't want to clear and you need to get back to the surface. You can't stay down forever, but what can you do? What you can do is take your thumb and literally hold a column of water against the eardrum. What you're doing is you're essentially splinting the eardrum in a fixed position and now encouraging the air to come down the eustachian tube. So rather than going through the pain of the eardrum bulging outwards more and more and more and more and more, what you're rather doing is you're keeping the eardrum fixed in a neutral position and you're allowing or encouraging air to go down the eustachian tube. Okay, so that's just a hint for people who've wondered about reverse block. Okay, last one. 75 meter dive on trimix. Okay, that means there's helium in the mixture. Dive and decompress over 90 minutes. They start already hearing uh, ringing in the ears at nine meters, vertigo at three meters, and they surface with hearing loss, vertigo that lasts more than 10 minutes, and let's just make it really easy, at mild joint pain and a blotchy skin rash. Okay, so pop quiz, what do you think that's gonna be? Hmm. 
Yep. Now that's pretty much, uh, that's, uh, I would say, uh, the, the amount of commitment we're going to get, and that's right. That is classic in ear decompression illness. Usually, for reasons that we're not in quite, sure, quite sure of, is <clears throat> this, the gas switches at 30 meters are critical. And the modeling isn't ideal yet, um, but the, the uh, inner ear is uniquely vulnerable to decompression illness. And the reason for that, you can actually imagine for yourself. The middle ear is the last gas that you equalized into your middle ear. The inner ear has essentially the gas circulating that you're breathing right now. And those may be completely different mixtures of gas. Do you follow? What you equalized, that you put in the middle ear. What's circulating in the blood and being circulated into the inner ear is essentially what you're breathing now. And the difference between the two may precipitate uh, inner ear decompression illness. Okay, cool. Cool. So the features are... Typically, deep technical diving, the onset with gas switches, and these individuals will not have evidence or very unlikely have evidence of middle ear barotrauma because it's not a barotrauma-related issue. It's an inert gas and decompression-related issue. So vertigo is profound. There may be deafness and tinnitus but the vertigo is usually quite significant. Okay? All right, so let's move on. This is just a note to say, if a person has any ear barotrauma, we usually, we usually don't want to recompress them. I won't say never, because there are situations where we actually do, but for the most part, we don't want people valsalvying with an inner ear barotrauma, especially if there's a fistula. If you don't know, one of the options is to do what you're seeing here, which is a myringotomy, a hole in the eardrum. So we've deliberately made a hole in the eardrum so the person doesn't need to equalize, and both ears have the hole. So the person doesn't need to equalize at all. And I've made a lot of holes in a lot of eardrums over the years, mostly with hyperbaric patients. Okay, so just remember the emphasis, the decompression illness group, you'll have the manifestations, usually deep dives, technical dives. They need a chamber, most likely. If, you, if you're unsure or if there were forceful equalizing attempts, it's probably more likely to be an inner ear barotrauma. Okay, and with that, we're moving to the sinuses briefly. Okay, so we've got four pairs of sinuses. And the first pair is the maxillary sinus. This is the one on x-ray we usually find abnormalities. And guess where people have symptoms? Where do they experience the pain? We can do this. We can do this quickly, guys. Yeah. All right, it's coming in. Okay. Now it's interesting that people sit behind the eyes, and the answer is actually in the upper teeth, because if I go back you see that it is adjacent to the upper teeth. It could theoretically cause pain behind the ears, but it's unlikely or it's rarely uh, the cause of that. The next sinus I'll, I'll be showing you after the frontal sinus is the, is the one uh, that we'll uh, discuss more in detail as far as that's concerned. Okay. All right. So teeth pain, tooth pain, uh, maxillary sinus. Then the next 
frontal sinus. The frontal sinus has got a very thin little tube that runs there. Where are these people going to get pain? All right, hang tight. Chink. All right. And the answer is, and I'm going to, again, you, you guys are nice and responsive. I really appreciate that. But I also respectful of your time is essentially above the eyebrows. Uh, people uh, describe it as if they've been kicked by a horse. Um, it can be really, really painful. And it's just above the eyebrows. Okay. And that's the classic presentation of a frontal sinus barotrauma. Okay, ethmoids. The ethmoids are here in relation to the eyes, giving the game away a little bit there. Where do you think they'll feel the pain? Oops, I didn't get my, uh, there we go. Yeah. It's... Yep. Yeah, I definitely gave the game away. <laughs> but that's all right. That's all right. Why not? All right, just hold yes. on. Okay. Uh, oh, it's in relation to the eyes. It's yeah. in relation to the eyes. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. All right. You'll let me know if the Facebook ones are any different. No, they but they we, they're on track. They're on track. It's uh, I'm struggling. On track. Track. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. And the last one we want to know is. Where do you get or experience the pain if the sphenoid sinus, the sinus that's right here at the back, if there is an obstruction? So, pop quiz, where do you think you'll experience the pain there? Um, okay, now I'm just see where we're at now. Okay, hang tight. We've got about 34, 40, 85 percent of people have voted. Okay. Yep. Gonna... Yep. And 82 percent have got it right. It's classic on the top of the head or the back of the head. It's not the most common sinus to be involved, uh, but it is um, a, a significant sinus to be involved. I mean, if you have pain there, you shouldn't continue diving. Um, but it is the one that is most likely to give you the the pain on the top of the head or the back of the head. So you guys did great. You actually answered that uh, very, very well. Right. And uh, uh, to, to answer the question, those of you that that had the, uh, the question, how do you treat f uh, to prevent um, barosinusitis? Essentially, we have the person uh, treating the, uh, um, uh, the Eusachian tube with a topical lying back, lying sort of with a head back. What we do when we're treating people for sinus issues, we actually do the reverse. We have them with their nose facing down. And so that, so that the drops actually run into the upper part of the nose, because that's where the passages are, especially the passages that connect the frontal sinus. Okay. So instead of lying backwards, we have the people bending forwards, okay, and having their nostrils facing up so that you can put the drops in, and the drops then go down and open uh, the uh, the little tubes or the or the holes, I should say, that connect um, the the sinuses. So the topical sprays are good there. Okay. Yep. All right. So. We're at the summary stage, and uh, uh, I'm just going to leave you with a couple of pointers. Remember, if you pull on the ear and it's painful, then it is going to be external otitis or swimmer's ear. Right? That's the take-home message there. Pro plugs work for some people, and I gave you some of those slides. Decongestants. Rare circumstances where we will use that. And I gave you uh, my approach. Deafness. 
you look at the profile, if it's deep and mixed gas, you think more in ear decompression illness, but it's rare. If it happened on a shallow dive and the person struggled to equalize, and you can see that the tympanic membrane um, um, is red, which uh, we actually teach lay people nowadays to do, then it's most likely middle ear barrow trauma with or without any ear barrow trauma. Okay? So the profile and the, and the breathing of mixed gas is a, is a big uh, flag for a decompression illness. Okay. Vertigo. If the vertigo lasts less than 10 minutes, it's almost always alternobaric vertigo. Almost always. The other possibilities are there, but they will last longer than 10 minutes. Okay, they'll carry on after 10 minutes. So if it's less than 10 minutes, it's this. If it's more than 10 minutes, it's going to be those. And remember, with middle ear barrow trauma and in ear barrow trauma, you're going to be able to see the abnormalities on the eardrum because there's also middle ear barrow trauma involved. Hope you guys got that. We spoke about the things to avoid. Milk. Um, we spoke about vasomotor rhinitis. Uh, we spoke about avoiding smoking and so on and not with inflammation uh, and uh, not using decongestants for more than four to five days. And last, equalize easy, early and often and start equalizing already at the surface. That's a very, very important thing. And last but not least, if I haven't made it clear by now, call Dan or write to me, send us emails, uh, make sure that we can get an answer to you. We actually have a group of ENTs. They call themselves DENTS for diving ENTs. And they are people that actually are divers themselves and are very, very sympathetic towards uh, getting divers uh, to dive. So we will be able to get you most probably to a specialist that, that really, really understands the situation. So we encourage you to call Dan. And that, Mornay, uh, is really my story. Well, so uh, over well, to you. Thank you very much. Well, I think that was amazing. I don't know, possibly some uh, of the folks uh, that attended the webinar can uh, leave some comments there so we can gauge whether this was useful. Uh, I have seen some um, a bit earlier. Everything seemed very positive, but now... It is time for that lucky draw. So uh, if everybody can just give me a second so I can uh, just enter the names into that software that I have, then um, I can do that quickly. Uh, okay, let's hold on. There it goes. Okay, hang on. Uh, France, you can't have them. All right, there we go. I've got two names here. I've got Ben van der Linde, uh, who uh, won the hoodie. And uh, Rudolf Ace, who won the um, um, uh, the jacket. So I'll get in touch with you guys. I've got your details. And then we'll make the arrangement sizes and how to get all that stuff wow. to you. Let me just uh, make the, the names available so I don't forget. Well done. Happy days. Lucky, well, lucky. Congratulations. I've got that red one, and it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Sorry uh, for the others if there's envy, <laughs> but you can always always buy one for yourself. Uh, yeah. they, they're really, really good uh, for all weather situations, uh, especially the red one, yeah. which um, uh, has a... Anyway, uh, there'll be more uh, opportunities with the webinars. We're going to be... Um, uh, launching, uh, you know, over the, the course of the year. Um, but what I'd like to say is um, I'd like, it, it'll be great if we can um, have you guys join again and help spread the word. I've got some amazing um, speakers lined up for August. And um, I guess with August being a uh, women's month, uh, that'll be the theme. You know, I'll have 
some some uh, we've already made um, contact with uh, some really interesting ladies uh, that do great work when it comes to conservation uh, studies on great white sharks free divers and some of our own homegrown dan docks uh, so uh, keep a lookout for some of the correspondence i'll share with you guys once again thank you so much uh, for making time i know it's been a long evening but uh, from uh, the comments it seemed like it was really amazing, informative. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amazing and all that stuff. So from our side, thank you so much. This brings us to the end of uh, this evening. If you have any questions, uh, maybe now is the time to ask. If, um, if you don't have any, uh, in the email I'll send you tomorrow, there will be a prompt that you can use to get in touch with, uh, with Dr. Cronier if you have questions that you'd like to ask him. Um, and then, yeah, keep a lookout tomorrow afternoon. I'll send that email with all the, the links to the replay and some other resources. From my side, thank you so much. Stay healthy, stay safe, and let's hope we can start diving soon. Uh, Dr. Cronier, I don't know if you'd like to say the last couple or a few uh, words just before we go. Well, I just want to thank you guys. I'm blown away by the, uh, the comments that uh, you've posted and the appreciation that you've shown. And uh, you've no idea how that really encourages us and, and uh, gives us the opportunity to also learn together. And as I said, this, you, you've given us uh, substance for an article because we actually have uh, some statistics that we'll be able to share. And um, uh, it stimulates us and uh, we wish you well. Thank you very much for participating. And um, even if we ran on a little bit, I hope that the extra information was worthwhile. So with that from my side, in any case, goodbye. Signing off. Yeah, good night. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Catch you next time. Toodles. Bye.